So I'm going to start off. Uh, we're just going to take about 10 minutes uh, and go through a little bit of the project, uh, both Trish and I. But Anne Marie's going to appreciate this. But I want to start off with many years ago, uh, there was an esteemed colleague of mine at Chicago Tribune named Bill Gaines. And Bill took me on a tour of the underground network of Chicago, the Pedways. And he took me to the cafeteria, cheap cafeteria, which he liked to eat at. And as Anne Marie knows, he's famous for knowing every cafeteria in Chicago. And that this was his five-star dining experience. And, and he took every new guy at the Tribune to along on these tours. And, and Bill told me, you know, one, one time when we were out, he goes, Mike, it's all one story. It's all one story. And he would go around the Tribune occasionally just say, it's all one story. And, and, and I remember, you know, he never quite explained what he meant by that. Like, we were supposed to figure that out eventually. But, but what, what I want to say is that, you know, uh, he's right. You know, and, and we're here today, I think, Trish and I, because cause it is all one story to some degree. You know, the origins of this story was, uh, in 2011, I was standing here for a series I did at the Seattle Times called Seniors for Sale. And it was about uh, how the state of Washington was exploiting seniors and putting them into private owned residential homes. So any homeowner could, could operate a home and take in seniors. And so uh, what I came across is a little nugget that the federal government rewards states for moving people from expensive care settings to cheaper care settings. So when I came back to Chicago uh, uh, just a couple of years ago, I started asking myself, well, I wonder you know, what the government is paying Illinois to do. I wonder what Illinois is doing with their seniors. And so in an obscure state report, saw this, this little nugget, that there were 3,000 group homes uh, for uh, people with disabilities, adults with disabilities. I thought, wow, 3,000 group homes. I mean, that's amazing. And so, I asked the state, where are the group homes at? You know, where are they located? Well, we're not allowed to tell you. The addresses are secret. Well, how many people get injured or killed in these homes? We're not allowed to tell you. That's secret. There was no way to know what was happening in the homes, where the homes were located. Our first FOIA that we filed, they denied the addresses and said, so even though they're state funded, even though they're state licensed, even though they're state inspected, you're not allowed to know where they're at. So one of the first things that, that Trish and I did was we filed a FOIA after the addresses for fire inspection records with the fire marshal's office. If they won't tell us where the addresses are as a state licensed facility, they have to be inspected by the fire marshal. And here it is, a separate agency that gave us all the addresses of every adult home that had been you know, inspected in the state of Illinois. So now we have a, a list of addresses. And then we wanted to try to figure out what's happening inside the homes. And that's where Emory alluded to the, the you know, how many, 200 FOIAs maybe, total? Yeah, you know, we lost count, <laughs> but uh, we kept an index. And in those FOIAs, we found uh, investigative records with no addresses, no names, but taking those and putting them into a database, we were able to cross-match them with public records and start trying to figure out who was who. Yeah, we, we used, like, we used um, police reports, you know, the usual, right? The police reports, 911 logs, um, uh, just piecing it together and entering the data. And what became clear to us pretty quickly was that what little information the state gave about this network of group homes um, was dramatically underrepresenting the scope of abuse and neglect that was going on. In other words, we're entering this data and getting it in there and looking at it. And I remember, you know, we we're saying to each other, like, that's really, our numbers don't match their numbers. And we'd enter a little bit more and be like, we have more than they do. And um, you know, we confronted the state with it, and then they presented a different set of statistics. Then we confronted them and said, nah. That's not matching what we did, and they presented a difference. And ultimately, they said, yeah, you're right. And they had to restate five years of, of what, you know, the horror that we were finding, essentially, to match our, um, to match our figures. And I think um, what struck me as both a journalist and um, as a mom of a child with a developmental disability was that the the... Um, misery and harm we were finding in these homes, the, the backdrop of this is that there's this amazing burgeoning civil rights movement going on right now of um, helping people with disabilities give them access to community, right? And, and, and I mean that very broadly. And um, in Illinois, this was what they were being offered. This this secret network of group homes where they were being abused and neglected and, and pushed into the corners. And, and our um, lead example 
uh, was an, was a, a gentleman named Thomas Powers who was um, 50 years old, um, profoundly intellectually um, challenged, um, nonverbal, so he was literally voiceless. And um, his family um, had been pressured to move him from a state institution into one of these group homes. And the idea was, you know, that the, that the family was being told was, we're going to downsize the institution, so you better get out now while you can still find a good place. And at the same time, they're saying, but, you know, the flip side is he's going to have all this freedom. He's going to have, you know, a much better life, a much fuller and more meaningful life. And ultimately, what we found was um, that particular group home um, decided he was too hard to manage, so they moved him to another group home. And his world got smaller and smaller until finally he was living in a very small home um, and he wasn't, he wasn't taken outside. And um, ultimately he was forced to sleep on a soiled mattress on the floor of a room used for storage. And that's where he was found dead. And um, yeah, and, and I think the, you know, as if that wasn't hor horrific enough, when the um, sheriff showed up to investigate what's going on here, um, right on the door in front of the, um, leading into, the, into that house is a huge sticker that says, not fit for occupancy. That was the group home, so. Anyway. <laughs> the Powers families, again, you know, we feel incredibly honored to tell the stories of these families who, who trusted us, you know, to be their voices. And what Thomas Powers showed us is that, you know, the undercurrent or the, the motivation of the statement goes back to the one story. Uh, the same thing that happened in Washington where they were moving seniors into these private homes. Illinois was doing it to people with disabilities. And it turns out that the state's being rewarded financially for moving people from institutional setting. I mean, who wants to live in a big box institutional setting? Why wouldn't you want to live in a cozy home in a neighborhood surrounded by family and friends and, and McDonald's? You can walk down and get an ice cream cone anytime you want. Well, that's not the reality for a lot of these people's lives. That's not what was happening. And what we found is that the state was trying to shut down institutions uh, and everyone just sort of naturally agrees that institutions are bad, developmental centers are bad, but we went into one of them. You know, it was more like a nursing home. And what we found is that the state was trying to shut them down so quickly that this one institution, they held an auction with disabled people. And they had providers of group homes and audience just like this. And they said, I have Bill. He's 65 years old. He can't read or talk. Who wants Bill? And the providers would look at their sheets and look how much Bill costs and they'd raise their hands. I'll take Bill, and sometimes there's a little, well, I really want Bill because he's gonna be really cheap. You know, they would pick the cheapest, or the people with the lesser disabilities first, the ones with severe disabilities didn't get picked. So we, we kind of revealed this auction. And we also found it got so ludicrous at, at one institution, they took a guy and told him he's gonna have a better life, and they moved him 100 yards across the street into a dilapidated kind of home, you know, 100 yards from the institution. So he, he went from having a swimming pool and a gymnasium to a little tiny room where he was in an over in a wheelchair that was too big for the home he's looking out the window at his old life you know and so that's how absurd it came and so from the institutions you know what what was being told by the state is that living in the community is always better that's what we heard over and over it's always better institutions are horrible which many of them are you know we acknowledge that many institutions have horrible horrible histories as they do in Illinois but we don't take for granted that the group homes are the, the, the answer, and that's really where we picked up the rest of the story. Yeah, oh no, and I was just gonna say the, um, the reforms um, when we presented all this were very swift. Um, in fact, some of them happened as we were closing out with the state. They were eager to tell us how they were fixing it. Right now, we're right on it, we're fixing it. And um, one of the first things they did, we found um, as we were looking into this and so when something goes wrong in a, in a group home and there's an allegation of abuse or neglect, it's the um, Human Services Inspector General's office that comes in and, and is supposed to investigate it. And um, when we're reading these reports, we were noticing like these odd inconsistencies. And I remember there's this light bulb moment where we figured out, wait, these aren't Inspector General employees. These are group home employees who are investigating it. So they had essentially delegated their investigative duties to employees of the group homes to investigate their colleagues, and they called them buddy investigators. We found out later. I mean, it's not written on. If, if only it were written, buddy investigators on the thing it would have the saved us a lot of time. The thing is, it's a, a state time. report with a yeah. state seal on it, 
and it's actually written by a private citizen, not the state, even though it had the imprimatur of the you know, inspector general's office. Yeah. So the buddy investigators were the first thing to go. They were like, we're not doing that anymore. No more buddy investigators. They, um, you know, uh, one of the things we pointed out to the state was that as, um, as a loved one um, of, of an adult with uh, an intellectual or de developmental um, disability, you would have no way of knowing whether the group home you're picking was a good one or a bad one. You would have no way of knowing whether there was a, a homicide in there the day before. It was just so secret that there was really no way of discerning, you know, and there were some decent group homes, right? And they were telling us too that because the state had so cheaped out this system, we were ranked almost at the very bottom. It depends on what, you know, ranking you're looking at, but we're, I can't remember. For was, funding, you mean? Yeah, for funding, it was like 48. Yeah, for state or, funding, yeah, for what's the state's commitment to funding community care? And, and Illinois was third to last. Yeah. So um, so even the gr good places were struggling to keep people where they're paying caregivers $9 an hour. Um, and um, so the, the reforms that came about were the state promised more transparency. They were going to start, um, although we're, we're still waiting for the details on this, they were going to start trying to figure out a way to make the addresses and the enforcement histories um, available to people who are trying to place um, uh, folks in group homes. They, um, help me out here, I'm trying to remember, well, there's so many. Talk about like, Deron Hart. Oh yeah, quickly. sure, sure, sure. So, and then of course they, um, one of the biggest things that happened right after we um, published was they went in and closed down a really troubled network of group homes that we'd written about. And um, this was a place that had been, um, uh, uh, where there had been a number of really troubling deaths and neglect cases dating back decades. And um, the business that ran it would shut down and reopen under a new name, all the same principles, shut down, reopen under a new name, same principles. And um, um, it came to my attention when I was, um, I came across a mom um, of a young man named Duran Harge who was only 23, so he had just, um, uh, in Illinois, you, you age out of the school system at 22. So he had just entered the um, group home system, and his mom was um, uh, a bus driver. Um, she would, you know, work all week, and she would spend her weekends at the group home every Saturday, Sunday. She was there like clockwork, and she saw some pretty bad things happen. And she'd show up, and her son would have sores on his body. And, th and then she called the state hotline, reported it. Inspector General would come out and say, "Nope." Nope, so the, the group home says they're self-inflicted. It's unsubstantiated. Seal it so she couldn't even see if they talked to anybody about it, right? And the next time um, uh, he wound up in the emergency room with human bite marks. She's like, these are on his back. They can't be self-inflicted. Nope, unsubstantiated, sealed. The third time she called the state hotline, um, her son was um, on a ventilator in the hospital in a coma. Um, he had been, um, uh, and, and nobody could tell him why. Nobody could tell her why. He was. Um, you know, near death. Um, he did ultimately survive, but he was in severe hypothermia and um, the hospital, nobody from the group home went with him to the hospital to even explain why this 23 year old, otherwise healthy young man, who again, nonverbal, no, no ability to speak, and it wouldn't have mattered anyway because he was in a coma, he couldn't, couldn't speak up for himself to explain what had happened to him. And the state went in again, said, um, and this wasn't a buddy investigator, this is one they bungled on their own. State went in and said, um, unsubstantiated, sealed it. And that's when she's like, okay, that's it. I mean, I've got to figure out a way into this, what was wrong. And um, so she sued and got a court order, which is the only way in Illinois you can get an unsubstantiated case um, um, unsealed. Um, got a court order and we looked at it and looked at the records and found that they had just completely and utterly bungled the case. They had relied on a witness, their sole witness that the state had, had interviewed for this um, uh, and had described how she had you know, found him on the floor of the group home and promptly responded and called 911 and got him prompt medical help. Never even showed up for work that day. So she just made up a story to save her job and anybody looking at it, I mean, Anybody looking at it would see her story was so full of holes. You know, they 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 never asked. You know, if if he was found in a heated group home, why did it take five hours to get his temperature to register on a thermometer because he was so ice cold? I mean, really basic questions were missed. So anyway, I'm sorry I'm going on a little too long about this, but um, the uh, uh, a memorable moment came when we were when I was able to call her and say, Tara, you're never going to believe this. They shut him down, and she. 
Um, and I'm going to get choked up now telling you because she got so choked up. Um, as you can imagine, it was a very emotional moment for her. And she said, you know, I just, I just wanted someone to hear my cry that those young adults needed help. And um, we were talking about it later. And isn't that kind of what investigative journalism does? You know, we hear those cries, you know, and we amplify them. So thank you and, so much. And I think one of the analytical moments was when we called the state finally and said, we'd like to know how many people have died in the adult group homes. And they said, how many do you have? And we gave them our number. And they said, that sounds about right. So that's why we say at least. <laughs> yeah. So. Thank anyway, you. Thank you.